Well, good morning and thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Ryan Kalei joined by Yanji Denise. This is Spotlight Hawaii. Thanks so much for starting the week here with us. And we have a week full of great guests. And we're going to jump right into it today, uh, Yanji, with a very special guest to start off this week. That's right. We've been talking a lot about tourism and travel. And who better to speak to than the CEO and president of Hawaiian Airlines, Peter Ingram. He is joining us live this morning. We always love having you on. Thank you for being here, Peter. Good morning, guys. Pleasure to be here. So we've seen the tourists in Waikiki. You drive to your favorite beach or brunch spot and you know they are back. Can you tell us, um, just anecdotally, we hear the flights are full. Who is coming here and what's the profile of the visitor right now? Yeah, the I mean, the, the flights are full from the mainland U.S. So the, the profile of the visitor is, um, you know, more so than what we saw pre-pandemic. It is very U.S. centric. That's the biggest difference. We don't have... Uh, the Japanese visitors in numbers. We don't have Australians or Koreans uh, coming at all right now. Uh, in terms of, of age demographic, it has started to go back more to the pre-pandemic normal. So, so during um, the early days of the Safe Travels program, when there were still a lot of, uh, of restrictions on travel and more concerns about the virus, some of our, our older visitors weren't traveling as much. So we saw Fewer bookings from people over the age of 60, more bookings by people in their uh, 20s and 30s. Those proportions have sort of, sort of settled out now as the virus has been brought under control largely in much of the country and vaccinations have proliferated. And so it's starting to look like, um, like the normal uh, mix of visitors, uh, the normal mix of American visitors at this point. We really don't have the international at all yet. You know, throughout this pandemic, you folks have had to adjust with the state protocols and the safe travel programs and all the changes that have happened. And recently, again, there was another change to that safe travels program with the lifting of restrictions for neighbor island travel, as well as for those who are uh, who have gotten a vaccination shot here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, how has your airlines been able to adjust with all these changing in rulings and these benchmarks that the state has put forth? Well, we're happy now that, that at least the rules are consistent for the entire state. We don't have some of the differences between uh, counties that were in place at various points over the last uh, year or so. It's kind of ironic seeing the, the June 15th lifting of the, uh, the inner island travel date. People you know, have probably lost sight of the fact that we actually lifted inner island restrictions on June 15th a year ago. And unfortunately, that only stayed in place until about the, the middle of August. But I um, think we're in a lot better place this time. I think it is uh, right for uh, those restrictions to, um, to start lifting and uh, allow people more opportunity to return to uh, the normal activities they did now that we have been so successful at bringing the virus uh, substantially under control. You know, of course, when we reach certain benchmarks as a state, 60% and then 70% fully vaccinated, various restrictions get to be lifted. 60% uh, is definitely within reach. The Lieutenant Governor was on here last week. He said we would get there within eight to 10 days. That was as of last Friday. So that's fast approaching. But given that that 70% threshold is going to take some work, he said that because kids are counted in, we actually need 82% of eligible uh, uh, people, basically adults or those 12 and up, I should say, so that's teenagers as well as adults, uh, to get vaccinated. So that could be a impossible bar, frankly, or it could take some time. Do you agree with the state's decision to, to set that kind of a threshold, or do you think it's too ambitious? Well, I, I think it is an ambitious uh, total. If you, if you look at the thresholds that other states have had in terms of the ones that have put vaccination uh, targets in their uh, goal setting for the removal of pandemic restrictions. Most of them are in the, the order of 70% of the eligible getting vaccinated as opposed to 70% of the total. And as you say, getting to 82%, I think is difficult. And, and I hope, uh, you know, if we have trouble reaching that level that, um, you know, the governor and, uh, and the advisors that are, uh, are helping him with policy, we'll take a look at the totality of the data that we have in terms of the number of cases, hospitalizations. And if things keep moving in a positive direction, we, we would like to see those restrictions 
uh, lifted sooner rather than later. But, um, you know, I think we've got to keep making sure we're trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible and see what we can do uh, to get as close as we can to to those limits so that we're in a position where we can uh, remove the remaining restrictions. You know, Peter, you've been gracious enough to come on this program a few times during the pandemic. And now that we're at this point, we're coming out of it, we're seeing tourist baths. I'm wondering if you can give us an update on how Hawaiian Airlines as a company is doing. I mean, I remember back in our talks uh, almost a year ago, you talking about losing $2 million a day. Uh, there were some a very dark times ahead for Hawaiian Airlines. What is the financial stability of the company looking like now? How are you folks, uh, how has you, have you covered and what are things looking like moving forward? Things are things are looking better. We're not fully recovered yet. We really need the international part of the business to come back. If you think about our business before the pandemic, we had about 55% of our revenue came from uh, North America. That part of our business is substantially recovered uh, at this point. In the month of June, we're actually flying about uh, 12 or 13% more capacity to North America destinations than we, we did in June of 2019. Uh, and we're going to have a load factor that is with, within a couple of percentage points of where we were. So the planes are full and people are traveling. Neighbor Island was about 20% of our revenue. And, and that is, uh, I would say, about 70 or 75% back at this point. We're still seeing a little bit more um, sluggish return of traffic, but with the restrictions coming off June 15th, we expect that to start to approach pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the part of our business that's not there is the 25% that was international. Um, there, we're still running uh, in the, the low single digit percentage of the passengers we carried before the pandemic. Uh, and unfortunately for us, there's really not much we can do here in Hawaii to bring that back. It really is more so a function of uh, vaccinations uh, in Japan and Korea, Australia and New Zealand catching up to the good progress we've had in the United States. So, uh, un you know, unfortunately, until that comes around, we really don't expect that part to recover. And, and that's what's going to enable us to go from stabilizing our business as we have now to really returning to uh, profitability and work on paying down some of the debts that we took on uh, during this difficult time. So I think it'll probably be towards the end of the year, you know, into the fourth quarter before we start to see that recover. But we're hopeful that it's going to uh, uh, recover as robustly as uh, as our U.S. mainland business has. That won't all happen at once. Can you tell us which countries you're eyeing first? What do you think will be the first to reopen uh, and then go down the line? Because I know that there aren't, you know, we have the Australians, the Japanese, Canadians, of course, and uh, and and Chinese as well. And then, then there is Korea too. So where, what sort of order are we looking at in terms of getting these folks back? Yeah, well, one one that's a once a week flight for us that we, we do have a timeline on is Tahiti. Uh, and so our, our Tahiti um, Saturday flights are going to be starting again on August 7th. And that was just announced last week. In terms of the more significant visitor destinations, I think it's likely to be um, Korea and Japan, probably in that order that um, that we start to see recover. And then Australia and New Zealand, I think, will follow uh, a little bit later than that. But it's a it remains a really fluid situation. And, you know, we're just going to look at where the demand is and have flights uh, ready to go as soon as there's an opportunity. We're already flying a couple of times a week to uh, to Japan and to Korea, mainly carrying cargo, but with a limited amount of passengers. And as the travel restrictions lift, we expect to fill those flights and then uh, ultimately, of course, add more again. You know, one of the areas you just spoke about that has helped carry the airlines right now has been the travel from the mainland and Hawaiian Airlines has recently started new routes from Dallas, I'm um, excuse me, from Austin and from uh, Orlando, as well as Ontario, California. Can you provide an update on how those routes are going and uh, how those routes are going and uh, what type of uh, business you're seeing from those markets? Yeah, it's uh, they're, they're, they're off to a good start. On, Ontario is really a, an expansion of our franchise in Southern California and providing more convenient access uh, for people who otherwise would have to 
uh, drive a couple hours on congested freeways to get to LAX airport. And, and we've expanded that flight to daily in response to demand, and we expect to keep it at daily. Um, Austin and Orlando are uh, new markets uh, for us. And uh, we've done a good job. Our team's done a really good job of introducing the Hawaiian Airlines service and hospitality to those places. Uh, we're flying both of them uh, three times per week at, uh, at this point, expanded from initially uh, twice a week service in the spring when we started. Uh, good traffic levels on both really mirrors the sort of load factors we have on our North America flights uh, overall. And, uh, you know, Austin is very much uh, Texas originating traffic, most of it in Austin, some coming from uh, San Antonio, which is about an hour or so drive away. In Orlando, it's a little bit of a mix of uh uh, Florida originating traffic, but also a pretty good mix of Hawaii originating traffic and, and second only to uh, Las Vegas on our network in terms of the percentage of traffic that originates on this end of the route. So obviously it's a popular place for um, not only the amusement parks, but, uh, but family travel. A lot of sports teams have tournaments in the Orlando area. And so we're, we're seeing some of that traffic as well on those flights. You know, getting back to vaccinations, one of the things that the state has been encouraging uh, companies to do is to incentivize vaccinations for their employees, giving them half a day off or other other ways to sort of encourage their, their employees to do that. Are you tracking vaccination rates in Hawaiian Airlines employees? And are, do you have any incentives? And, and would you ever get to a place, I guess sort of the follow-up to that is, would you get to a place where you were, would ever mandate vaccinations for any of your employees, particularly the ones who interact with large crowds like flight attendants? Tenants. Yeah, our, our initial approach was to just make sure we had access as easy as possible for our employees. And we worked closely with the, uh, the Department of Health uh, and the uh, State Department of Transportation to have vaccination pods uh, available at uh, Honolulu Airport. Some of the other airports we serve um, worked with um, uh, Queens as well around getting vaccinations available for people when uh, essential uh, employees were eligible for vaccinations. Subsequently, we have announced um, some incentives for our employees in terms of uh, additional uh, days off or um, forgiveness of sick days or uh, extra pay for people to get vaccinations. That's going to allow us to collect that vaccination uh, information. So I can't tell you, I don't have the percentages right now, but ultimately that is something that, that we do want to know. And one of the reasons it's important for us is as some of those international markets that we talked about earlier open up, um, we're not sure what the restrictions are going to be, whether they require people coming to say Australia, for example, need to have a vaccination to enter the country. And of course, for our pilots and flight attendants that are traveling on those routes, if those restrictions do exist, then we need to know who's been vaccinated so we can make sure we're, uh, we're only scheduling uh, people who are legally able to enter the, uh, the various jurisdictions we operate in. Um, that's a little bit of, of an unknown right now, but we, we think given the uh, approach some of the, these other countries have taken to managing uh, COVID uh, amongst their population, that that is a possibility we're going to have to be prepared for. As more travelers come back uh, to the islands, what are some of the areas that Hawaiian Airlines specifically is looking for help in, whether it be uh, hiring employees once again or looking for certain people to fill certain positions? What, what do you foresee in terms of just your overall workflow and workforce as being one of the state's largest employers of, of employees here in Hawaii? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of exciting, actually, after uh, going through a period of downsizing last year, having so many people out on voluntary leaves. It's, we're uh, excited to be in a position, again, where we're trying to hire. And we do have some, some areas of need, particularly uh, in our airport operations. We're, uh, we're hiring in a variety of different places, especially Maui is a place where we've, we've seen lots of, uh, of need. Um, we're expecting that by the end of the year, uh, even though we're still bringing back pilots and flight attendants from leaves, we expect by the end of the year, 
uh, we may be in a position, uh, we're likely going to be in a position where we're hiring for uh, pilots and flight attendants again. We have a variety of positions on our management team that are, are open. So uh, it is, uh, it's great to bring new people into the company. There's a lot of work for our HR department and our recruiting team to uh, get that done. But um, we're, we're excited to bring in uh, new people and new ideas and fresh sets of eyes to look at things we do so we can keep evolving our business. You know, there's a question here from Jolie. I, I'm just going to sort of synthesize it because it's rather long, but he's asking what the airline is doing to educate travelers about dangers like hiking and beaches. One of the things that we uh, talked about on this program last, I believe it was last week, it may have been the week before, but um, Mufi Hanneman was on here along with Kelly Sanders, uh, and they were talking about the profile of the visitor who's coming here. And they said that a lot of the folks who are coming here are first time guests uh, who are building that first relationship with Hawaii and may not be accustomed to. Uh, some of the ways that we do things and that, you know, there is this education piece that needs to be happening also so that we can establish those relationships and so that those visitors become repeat guests. Um, can you tell us about sort of, I know that the, so much of the focus has been on just COVID safety, wear a mask on board and all of that, but sure. how, do, how do we make sure that the people who are coming here understand, you know, our ways for, for lack of a better term, so that th that this tension between uh, Kama'aina and, and these visitors uh, does not grow. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. One of the things that we adopted as we, um, you know, started opening up again and coming out of the pandemic period was a program that, that we called Travel Pono. And it was part about educating uh, our uh, guests who are coming to Hawaii uh, about um, the expectations of the community, starting, as you said, with um, COVID restrictions that, that differ from place to place and, and you know, making people aware that there, um, there still is uh, mask requirements in some public places here, even if they've been lifted in other places. Uh, but, um, but some of it is about caring for uh, the environment and the community, um, making sure that um, that people understand um, when you're, you know, there are certain places that are going to be off limits, restricted trails and things like that. And that, that the, you know, people should avoid those and go to the places that are welcoming, try and uh, keep things clean. So I, I think there's more we can do in that. And it's been difficult, candidly, during this period. There's so much of that um, COVID information that we've had to communicate that there, there's only so many messages you've got the opportunity to deliver. But I do think as we get to the point where the travel restrictions are lifted and we have to give people less information about where to get a COVID test and what test is required and how you enter it in the safe travel site, um, there's more opportunity to pivot to some of these other communications uh, and you know some of these other messages um, that we want to have because I, I think you're right it's a, a real issue that there is a concern about the level of visitors in our community uh, even as they're essential for our economic well-being and getting our retailers um, back fully functioning getting our bars and restaurants uh, back to the point where they can employ people so We've we've got to find that right balance, and and it's important for us to um, to engage with people in that and be a part of the conversation. You know, going back to that same conversation that Yanji was referring to that we had a few weeks ago with uh, other tourism officials, one of the issues that we also had discussed was some of the changes that have been proposed by the legislature to the structure of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, its role in uh, future for hospitality and travel here in Hawaii, uh, as well as just changing of the uh, TAT tax structure and the way that that will be managed. Uh, there have been, you know, some arguments going on between those in the industry as well as those at the state capitol about who should be responsible for paying more? Should we be charging these visitors more money uh, to, to basically vacation here? Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you, do you think that that is something that uh, the state should do? Uh, we know that the governor has his intent to veto this that will be coming out this week, but I uh, wanted to get your overall thoughts on uh, just the structure of how things are being managed right now. Yeah, I, I think we have to, you know, like a lot of things in life where we have to look for balance. Um, you know, there is a lot of benefit um, that we get economically to support our, our general fund revenues, to support 
um, county and uh, and local uh, funds and to support businesses. So we, we do want to make sure um, that when we're we're setting the tax levels on uh, visitors and visitor accommodation, that we do it in a way that doesn't um, deter all that traffic from coming and, and stop us from getting any of that revenue at all. Um, it's it, The taxes there have been increased uh, a lot in the last several years. We've gone from um, you know 10% to 12%, which sounds like a 2% increase, but really it's a 20% increase. And with the changes that are proposed now, uh, taxes can be as much as 15% if there's another um, state and local surcharge that goes on top of it. So it's it's a, a, a big pool of uh, revenue and I think we've, we've got to manage it. And, and I think it would be a mistake um, not to have a, a thoughtful group within the uh, the state government focused on uh, on the building back the tourism industry as we get past the pandemic and doing it in a way that is thoughtful about balancing some of the protections of our uh, communities and our natural environment, our trails and beaches. So um, we, we've got to have a thoughtful uh, approach to all this, and we'd like to um, to be you know part of being engaged in those discussions as well. I want to get back to that financial piece that um, Brian brought up earlier. You know, you've been so candid with us about the the sort of financial picture of the airline throughout this process. Are you still losing money on a daily basis, or given that that fifty five percent of your business, talking about the the mainland travel, is basically back, are you guys sort of stable now? Would you say that you're still losing a lot of money, or you're kind of, you know, treading water, if you will? So, so we're not to the point yet where we are fully profitable on an income statement basis. Last year, we talked to you a lot about um, what our daily cash burn was, and you know, we worked that down from three and a half million dollars a day in the second quarter last year to about a million dollars a day by the end of the year. Um, we're a lot closer to flat on that number right now. So cash coming in equals cash going out, which isn't the ticket to long-term success, but is a heck of a lot better than where we were uh, a year or so ago. Um, what what we really need to to turn us into being profitable, not just to, uh, to cover our cash each day, but also to um, pay back those long-term investments in airplanes and other assets is getting that international part of the business back. And, and I, I think we'll be there in a few months, but we're, we're not quite there yet today. You know, and knowing that and in, in what you just said there, you know, you, you look at just the demand also from the community. Uh, we know that Hawaiian Airlines has uh, donated a million miles for the High Got Vaccinated program that the state is, of course, using to help incentivize people who have not get, gotten vaccinated yet. Just this weekend, I saw a bunch of purple Team Kokua shirts cleaning up the beach. I mean, uh, talk about that balance that you have to find with managing your company and the operations of Hawaiian Airlines, but also responding to the needs of the community because uh, there seems to be anytime there's a large event or whenever the public is in need, let's ask Hawaiian Airlines for help. I mean, it's got to be uh, a struggle to manage all of that. It's one of the things I'm, I'm most proud about being part of this uh, company. And I, you know, I gave a presentation to a, a business group last week and was, it forced me to go back and look at some of the things we were doing as a company last year and, you know, managing through the stress of those cash flow problems and trying to raise money and uh, negotiating um, agreements with our unions to have people going on leave, all of the difficult decisions we need needed to make last year. Um, through all that period, one of the things that was most gratifying was looking at the pictures of our team out at, um, you know, working to support the food bank and supporting other people in the community, not just our, our own employees. Um, people going and volunteering to do beautification projects at schools last summer, often the same school where uh, where they went to elementary school or, or high school. Uh, and and that is um, something that, you know, we're, we always want to support. We've been part of this community for 91 years now. We expect to be part of this community for a long time. Uh, the vast majority of our employees live here in Hawaii. Many of them were born and raised in Hawaii and feel, feel a special connection to the community. And you know, it, it really means something to us 
to have that Hawaiian name on the side of the airplane and understand what it represents. And, and I, I always take great pride in the way our employees are so generous with uh, their time and energy and um, supporting a lot of great causes here in our community. We are out of time, but I want to give you an opportunity to share some final thoughts with, with us. You know, you have the benefit, unlike us, of getting to see advanced bookings and see what is coming up. So if you could just, you know, in your, in your closing message today, tell us a little bit about what we can expect as a community when it comes to travel. What are your expectations for the remainder of the summer and, and going into the rest of the year? Yeah, I think definitely we're, we're looking for a continuation of what we're seeing right now in terms of North America with our, our bookings being, uh, you know, booked load factors at similar levels to where we were before the pandemic, which puts us on track for load factors in the, uh, the high 80s or low 90s on our North America flights. Uh, we're starting to see neighbor island uh, recover closer to pre-pandemic levels. That's a little bit closer in booking. Uh, and, you know, as we've, we've talked about, we're still waiting for that, uh, that international piece to come around, but hoping we get there uh, to some degree by uh, the fourth quarter. But uh, I expect it to be busy. It's, it'll be interesting to see as other destinations open up, does that, um, does that affect some of our demand? I, I really don't think uh, it will a lot. I, I don't think people were traveling to Hawaii because... Um, they couldn't go somewhere else. I think people will want to travel to Hawaii because they want to travel to Hawaii. And I, I expect us to uh, uh, to be able to ride some of the momentum and, and hopefully get people in our community back employed, get retailers back um, selling, get small businesses um, going as well, because it wasn't just Hawaiian Airlines that um, took some body blows during this period. All right. Well, Peter Ingram from Hawaiian Airlines, thank you so much again for taking time. Give us an update on how you folks are doing, of course, at Hawaiian Airlines, but also an update on the overall, uh, those visitors coming to our islands. We really appreciate you taking the time to start your week with us this morning. Thanks, guys. Good talking to you. Aloha. Thank you. Wow. Always really interesting to hear from him. You know, he, what he expressed is really what we're seeing, that the North American travelers are back, but that international piece obviously is critical uh, to their bottom line. Great to hear, though, that they are not at the levels that we thought they, they were. I mean, at one point, the lieutenant governor was speculating that if things didn't open up soon, we could see Hawaiian Airlines not make it. That obviously is not the case anymore. And that's very, very reassuring for our community, the source of so many jobs and our access uh, to the rest of the world. Um, but still a long road ahead. And you heard there also that he seemed to be in agreement somewhat with Lieutenant Governor Josh Green on uh, wanting to perhaps change some of the metrics uh, or at least consider other metrics when it comes to opening up the state rather than just looking at the vaccination rate and trying to get to that 70%. Yeah, we're going to have that conversation with Governor David Ige. He'll be here on the program uh, later this week on Friday and certainly something that we want to talk to him about as we have heard from many in this hospitality industry express those concerns about that lofty goal and if that is obtainable or not. Uh, we'll hear more from the governor about just that this week, but also good to hear that Hawaiian Airlines uh, is beginning that process of hiring uh, more individuals back into certain areas uh, within the state to help to bring some of those people back to work or maybe uh, new people who have shifted careers because of this pandemic as well. Uh, so those who are looking for future opportunities to maybe become involved in the hospitality industry, uh, good, good to hear that they're at a point right now where they are now hiring people uh, and uh, as they continue to expand, so to speak, of course, we talked a little bit about the success that they are having with these new routes to Orlando and Austin. And uh, we'll continue to track how well they do throughout this reopening, if you will, of Hawaii. Uh, we continue this conversation on Wednesday, where we'll be joined by uh, Mayor Derek Kawakami. That's right. We're very interested to hear from him. The last time he was on, Kauai had suffered a natural disaster with uh, some heavy rains and some roads washing out, some very key routes that uh, connect parts of the island, people to medical care and to the, the things that they need. So we'll be talking to him about how the rebuilding is going and then also just getting an, a, a, an update on what travel is like to that island. They've been one of the most restrictive when it comes to their own protocols for inviting tourists back 
Um, and now that we see visitors coming back to the state, we want to hear about how, what the financial outlook is for them. Uh, before we leave this morning, though, we do want to make a note of a passing this weekend on Saturday. Uh, our former colleague over at KITV and dear friend Robert K. Kaula passed away unexpectedly on Saturday morning. Uh, he is a legend in Hawaii, in the sports community, in uh, his own musical career, and of course in broadcasting. We were shocked and very saddened by this news. We know that so many in Hawaii are mourning right along with us. Uh, that's right. And uh, as we take a look here, this is what we called our class picture when you and I were both there at KITV with Robert, uh, sharing so many fond memories with that uh, class, if you will, and, and that crew of people. You know, I think uh, Paula Alcana said it best over the weekend. She said, you know, Robert was a type of person that was, of course, just a, a larger than life presence. And he was a guy that could make you cry, but the very next day be giving you a hug. Uh, he was an intimidating person to work with, I, I can tell you that, but he, at the same time, uh, he was just uh, one of the nicest guys out there uh, and very particular about the way in which he operated and the way he did things because he was a uh, perfectionist. I mean, if you looked at his office, he was very adamant about not touching anything <laughs> around his desk. And, uh, you know, but it just spoke to the level of success that he did and, and what he was able to accomplish. You know, we've had the opportunity to work with him, as we said, at KITV. You sat next to him for five years. Uh, I, of course, a colleague of his there, as well as at Spectrum Sports, and just such a respected figure uh, through throughout all those areas that we've been able to work with him on. That's right. Our hearts go out to his family, particularly his children. Uh, we are thinking of them, and we know, as as we said earlier, that Hawaii really does mourn with him. Uh, this The community really has lost a very important figure, and we just wanted to make note of his passing and uh, wish wish him, you know, our fondest aloha. Um, today so it was a very very difficult weekend and uh, we really we really do want to pay our love and respect to robert kekala we thank you so much for tuning in here to spotlight hawaii we'll see you right back here on wednesday uh, for with mayor derek kawakami aloha aloha <laughs>